just got it. We just got the link. So uh, can you are you can you hear me? Topic of connecting the internet, where we will talk a little bit about the work that we and our community have done around internet and digital sovereignty. As long time supporters of the ICF, a pleasure to be here with you again on organizing a, another. I'm Agustina Calegari, manager of community and external engagement with the Internet Society, and I will be doing that moderation session and. Mark Carvel, with uh, on site, will be acting as an on site moderation. We have a great panel of speakers that I will give, but firstly, to kick off this meeting, I would like to give the floor to Andrew Sivan, the Internet Society CEO. Say hi. Hi, guys. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say hi. I got a couple things to say, but uh, in the interest of time, rather than this meat ladder, we should get to the substance of my work. Give myself again. Welcome. Thank you, Andrew, for being here. Um, and again, uh, we apologize for the delay in starting this session. Um, as you know, the Internet Society has a community of 120 chapters all over the world, and one of them is the Ethiopian chapter. So now I would like to hand it over to Adopna Necho Malatu. I hope your name well, uh, Internet Society uh, chapter leader of Ethiopia. To the chapter and say some welcoming this country as well. So I think he's in the right part. Yes. I don't know you're about to start. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Uh, we just we just got problems with it. Fragmentations, which, as you see, the IGF is the themes of the event and also the term. And we have a panel that is made up of Natalie Campbell, Senior Director of the American Government and Regulatory Affairs of the Society, Emmanuel Ogu, member and part of the Director of the Initiative, Mirha Kitawe, IAB Chair, as well as Mel Guzman, senior advisor uh, uh, with the society. And I hope that you can all hear me well and that you can all access the session. So each speaker will have, well, I will say five minutes now because we have a uh, lot of time. And want to make sure that there is time for comments and, and questions at the end of the session. And we uh, so I guess Natalie, you can start, right? I'm happy to do that. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Agustina mentioned, um, internet fragmentation is a really big theme at the IGF this year, and for a good reason. I mean, the pandemic was a really harsh reminder of the importance of making sure that the internet really is for everyone. And at the same time, that job is not just connecting the unconnecting, connecting the unconnected, it's protecting and defending the internet we do have to make sure that it remains for everyone. And if there was ever time to protect the internet, this is it. So a bit about myself, I'm a knitter. And because I'm a knitter, I have a really deep appreciation for the internet and the years and human efforts that have gone into knitting and building something that has become such a tremendous resource yes, for humanity. Knitting and long pieces of string into 
uh, with a series of stitches and knots into something that is really useful. It's a sweater, maybe it's a blanket. And I'm not joking when I say it has literally taken me years to knit sweaters before. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, the decades that we have put into efforts to building the internet and transforming it into such an incredible resource that it is today. And I know my knitting community would cast shade on me for saying this, but the internet is better than the sweater. We spent decades growing the internet. People around the world have worked together to knit a bigger, stronger, more resilient internet and a useful network and networks following this simple pattern. It's bigger than any one of us because of the value it brings it all. And because of this value that has brought us all, it has connected us like no other innovation ever. But because we've all contributed to this sweater, we all have a responsibility to protect it from unraveling into a fragmented version of itself, or in other words, a splinter net. This year, the Internet Society has seen some concerning trends that could lead to the future that we don't want, a splinter net. So what is a splinter net? Before explaining that, I think it's really important to have a good grounding about what the Internet is in the first place. So the internet is made up of a foundation of critical properties that all together form the internet wave networking. I like to think of it like the business model for the internet. It's the simple foundation that the internet needs to exist. It's what separates it from being another type of network, like an office intranet. Or following the knitting analogy, it's a simple pattern that enables any network to become part of this global sweater that benefits us all. But the internet of course, is not just about the technology. Every network that wants to participate in the internet, whether they know it or not, must adhere to the simple foundation that enables us to be globally connected and collaborate easily without borders. The splinternet, however, is the opposite of the internet. The splinternet is the idea that the open, globally connected internet, we all use splinters into a collection of islands that don't talk to each other. So why are we worried about this right now and more than ever? Well, today, businesses, governments, and organizations worldwide are increasingly making decisions that could undermine the way the internet works and unknowingly or knowingly start to unravel this foundation um, of the incredible resource that we've put so much effort into creating and they might not even know it. So as I mentioned before, internet fragmentation is a theme for good reason. This year we've seen increasing number of government decisions, but also geopolitics start to um, lead to greater concerns and trends that could bring us to that worst case scenario, which is the splinter net. So the splinter net would complicate our ability to connect with one another by fragmenting the internet into separate networks that don't work together so easily. Uh, in a splinter net, I might not be able to have a Zoom conversation with my colleagues here, or I might have to pay a toll fee to work on a shared document if it's stored on another network in another country. But what actually causes a splinter net? There are so many paths that could lead to a splinter net. This could be anything from shut internet shutdowns, for example. When a government tries to disconnect the networks within its borders from the internet, it has serious consequences for citizens, or the way that I like to think of it, it's like unraveling the um, the sleeve on a sweater, right? It's it's a disconnecting it from this global resource that we call the internet. There are also politicized decisions about internet access and infrastructure that could lead to a splinter net. This year, uh, and apologies for anyone touched by this horrible war in Ukraine, but we've seen really concerning calls to disconnect other networks from the internet that also go against the principles of what the internet needs to exist and thrive. And finally, and this is the most, one of the more tricky um, threats to mitigate, but we are seeing increased policies and business decisions that don't protect what the internet needs to exist and thrive. But governments around the world tackling really hard, really hard complicated issues, misinformation, online harms, and, you know, with, sometimes laudable goals of trying to mitigate some of these harms for citizens, they are proposing decisions that don't understand their impact on what the internet needs to exist and thrive. And with so many governments trying to tackle these issues and making decisions without remembering what this beautiful internet needs to exist in the first place, 
this could lead to that worst case scenario of a splinter neck. So enough about the problems. How do we fix this? How do we get back on course and protect this wonderful resource that we all appreciate? So the Internet Society has created earlier over the last two years, I would say, the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit. You can think of it like the Environmental Impact Assessment, but for the Internet. What it does is it takes, it's based on two white papers, the critical properties of the Internet way of networking, which establishes what the Internet needs to exist in the first place, and the enablers of an open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy Internet. This is how we get from an Internet existing to the type of Internet that we all want and governments have, many governments and organizations have committed to working towards um, for an Internet that we want today in the future. The Internet Society and its global network of chapters have been increasingly using this toolkit to analyze the impact of decisions and proposals around the world to better understand how they impact the Internet, but educate governments and businesses on how to mitigate these harms to the Internet. It's been a really great um, you know, collaboration method that we've not only done with our community, but that has helped us have really fruitful conversations with actual decision makers who, as I mentioned before, might pose risk to the internet without even understanding it. But this is all still very reactive. What needs to happen to really change course is that governments need to start adopting the practice of conducting internet impact assessments in their decision making processes. The more that this becomes a tool of due diligence, just like environmental impact assessments, which I understand it's not a practice done everywhere in the world. I've seen impact assessments. This needs to become a core part of the decision making process. The Internet side can help with that um, in order to protect the Internet and to really chart a course towards protecting and defending the open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy Internet. There's so much at stake. Livelihoods, public health, national economies, we need to protect the internet and this is a really useful tool to do it um, so with that um, i want to thank you all for listening and i look forward to having one of our community members share about their experiences using the toolkit um, to help educate um, about certain regional problems and, and how to make the risks of harm thank you so much everyone Thank you, Natalie. And yes, we can give the floor to Emmanuel Ogu. But before we do that, I want to make sure that people on site are hearing you, are hearing as well. Mark, can you confirm that uh, they can hear as well? Yeah, I think everybody's hearing okay in the room. Is that right? Because we cannot hear you, Mark. I think you are on mute or the audio is not working. Okay, I, I, I didn't know I had no. to unmute. You can hear me now. Okay. <laughs> Um, because I've got the mic on as well. Yeah, but only your audio. I can't hear you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I realize. But, okay. Anyway, um, I'm, uh, is everybody hearing, uh, the speakers? Okay. Anybody, everybody's hearing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Agustina. So, Perfect. okay. And, and, right. and we can hear you and, and I hope we can hear the rest of the, of the room. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So, Emmanuel, if you are there, please. Victoria, yours. Yes, Agustina. Hi, everyone. Good day from Nigeria. Um, Manuel, um, I lead the team at the Dear Government Organization. Recently, we have had the opportunity to um, apply the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit um, towards interventive recommendations for policy development in Nigeria. Um, it is easy to understand the incentives and motivations for which governments around the world, particularly in Africa, continue to seek you know, pathways for consolidating interest and control around the internet and digital resources in their um, ecosystem. But then, like uh, Natalie has already previously explained, at the fulcrum of all of this is, is the concern that at the end of the day, when everyone continues to take away bits and pieces of the internet without um, recourse to what the long-term effect and the impact is going to be on the open model that has ensured that someone on one side is able to communicate and interact with someone on the other side without you know hindrances without uh, barriers and without uh, obstructions 
if we fail to understand and take into consideration these implications, then the impact would be for all of us to, to, to bear in the long run. And so we have been supporting the government of Nigeria. And recently we have worked on two uh, policy recommendations or two bodies of, of regulations that the government has sought to propose. Um, the first had to do with the social media bill in 2021. Uh, where we worked with the government and uh, trying to propose recommendations and assess the impact of the regulation on the open and interconnected model of the internet. And then leading up to the Twitter ban of 2021, which uh, made national and international headlines at some point, uh, we were able to support the government some of the evidences and uh, regarding the impact on the internet of this bill and of this ban and also regarding the economic implications, not just for digital cities and for the country at large. In the long run, working with partners, the Internet Society Nigerian chapter, we're able to uh, work with other stakeholders in the ecosystem to see to the lifting of the ban uh, sometime in January 2022. And then, you know, at, at, at the fulcrum of all of this importance to underscore the importance of the open model of the internet you know, to all of these discussions that we have. On the one side, we have governments who are often genuinely uh, interested in tackling some of the decisive issues around internet regulation in their various countries, issues around cyber crimes, issues around online safety and child pornography, issues of hate speech, you know, and misinformation and disinformation in all of these forms. This is our data often genuine intentions, but then the approach has often been the problem. So between this intention and the outcomes that we see, a lot of love seems to be lost in between. The stakeholders begin to feel that their interests and their concerns are undermined in the drafting or in the propositions of these regulations. And then we have continued to work with government and stakeholders to, to try to build in a multi-stakeholder perspective that allows all stakeholders to see the entirety of what a regulation proposes, not just in terms of how it affects the but then in terms of how it affects the uh, acceptable, what acceptable principles around human rights, around accessibility and affordability, what accessible principles around open source and you know having an open interconnected medium that does not uh, provide barriers or hindrances and that does not favor certain players you know, at the expense of others in the industry. And this has been the focus of the work we have been doing, um, working with stakeholders in Nigeria. Uh, I will give the floor back to Augustina. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. So now I would like to give the floor to Mirha. I leave chair to share her views about this topic. She's in Addis, so I hope we can hear her. Can yes. you help? Yes. Ah, yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Um, uh, we... okay. Maybe you also, you also have to turn your. Have to turn. Perfect. Um, okay, you can hear me. Can you know the your audio? There you go. Okay, uh, we have some audio problems in the room, but we are using the local laptops now, so hopefully it works now. Um, okay, thank you for introducing me. Um, before I start, maybe I can say a few words about the IEB, the Internet Architecture Board. So the IEB is one of the three leadership groups of the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. And the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, is the main organization uh, developing and maintaining some of the major Internet protocols, like the IP protocol, the HTTP protocol. Um, the role of the Internet Architecture Board is to somehow provide architecture oversight, as the name says. Um, so what we do is we look at not only the, the protocols itself as a building block, but we also try to get like the big picture about how, how, how everything works together or if there are kind of any kind of gaps and try then to force the discussion within the standardization organization um, if we find such, such gaps. Um, also, the um, IAB is also the contact point for kind of external outreach or other STOs. Um, so that's the IAB. Um, and I'm when I'm sitting here, I can't actually speak for the IAB because the IAB um, is a number, is a group of experts and we don't agree on everything necessarily. Um, 
But I can say that the IEB is monitoring and discussing the global development uh, on internet governance and its impact on the internet and also the request for digital sovereignty that we see. Um, the ITF's mission is actually quite simple. It's to make the internet better. Um, but if you look at the mission statement of the IETF, um, you will see that we also define better in a way um, based on where the internet comes from. We actually say in our mission statement that we want to make the internet useful for communities that share our commitment to openness and, and fairness. So this is how, where the internet is based and that's also what we are committed to. The success of the internet is really based on the, the way we design it as of based on a set of principles and creating building blocks that you can use um, in different ways together. And that has provided the success and the innovation that you see today on the internet, that you can see so many services that have bloomed over time uh, and the internet is ever changing. And this is one of the base principles, how we maintain these protocols and how we maintain the technology that provides the internet. What we do see, however, is that more often new technology also, deployment of new technology gets blocked um, in the name of digital sovereignty. And this is really concerning, especially if this new technology is focusing on progress. Okay. Okay. Oh no, that's oh, no. a broken that's audio. Broken audio Can you still hear me? Ah, very strange noise. I don't know where it's coming from. Yes, I think, yes I think this is audio. audio. We can record our challenges, right? But we can hear you now. Okay, can you still hear me? I think you're on mute now. Okay. I can try it. No, it's getting a kind of 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 a kind
So um, our work on protecting the internet includes producing research on how different national approaches to digital sovereignty could impact the internet, for example. Um, this year, the Internet Society conducted a policy development process with our community to better understand the issue of digital sovereignty and how it could impact uh, the internet as we know it today. today. So uh, my colleague Noah will present some of the results. So, uh, the first years. Thanks, Agustina, and hi, everyone. Um, so, I would like to pick up on what Natalie said earlier about there being many paths to internet fragmentation and a focus on one path. Um, and this is one that is being driven by governments that want to exercise their sovereignty over how the internet works within their borders. So we've come to know it as digital sovereignty, which Mira has already mentioned. It's also known as cyber sovereignty. Um, sometimes they say tech sovereignty. Uh, and as Agustina said, this has been the subject of an internet society study this year. I would like to qualify that from what we found, digital sovereignty means a lot of different things to different people in different countries. So it would be unwise to just equate digital sovereignty with internet fragmentation. There are people, and many of them are well-meaning people, who are using this term or expressing support for digital sovereignty and fragmenting the internet is far from what they'd like to happen. I see Pedro in the, in the room, and we've had a few chats with Pedro about this. So I know that uh, Pedro, you will agree. <clears throat> There is one approach, however, to digital sovereignty, at least one approach, that could fragment the internet. Can we guess what this is? I'm not going to take more time at all. One of the reasons a government or a state wants to assert sovereignty in the digital space is when it's worried about the national security of the country. So it wants to secure the digital space within its borders as a way of making the country more secure. And this becomes a threat to the global internet when the way that the state wants to do that is by giving itself more power to control how the internet operates locally. Maybe it wants to have a greater hand at managing internet infrastructure Maybe it wants to direct how networks operate. We've seen various examples of this, and I'm going to name a few. One example is when a government, through its assigned agency, wants to control the flow of traffic within the country or to and from the country. So what it does is it comes up with its own routing policies. Another example that's happening in another country is a government telling everyone to synchronize their clocks in their, in their ICT systems to only one source of time. And that is the government's own time servers. So we know that typically systems would synchronize their clocks with multiple sources of time you know, to minimize the risk of getting the time wrong. And this is part of what makes the internet robust and what makes the internet resilient. So you can see from these examples that there is an attempt to centralize the processes and the mechanisms that are decentralized and distributed on the internet. A final example is one country requiring operators to use the DNS resolvers that are controlled by the government. So this would effectively allow the government to change how name resolution works in the country, or maybe it would even create its own alternative to the global DNS. So it's easy to see how this would effectively induce or it would prompt fragmentation in the global network of networks. I mean, to say the least, imagine if more governments opt to do this, because these, what I, the examples that I've been telling you are actually happening in different parts of the world. So this is just a teaser 
We have a lot more to say about how digital sovereignty may be affecting the internet, including the way that Mira has discussed. I would end with an invitation to please read our upcoming report. It's called Navigating Digital Sovereignty and Its Impact on the Internet, and it's coming out on Thursday, December 1. So please mark your calendars. You can download it uh, from the Internet Society website, and we hope you enjoy reading it. Thank you, Noel. So I guess that now we can open the floor for comments and, and questions. Let me see if there are any questions on the chat. And Mark, could you check if there are any hands up in the room? And fingers crossed, the audio and everything works. Uh, I see one hand online, so maybe we can start with that one. Ethan, Ethan, right? I'm, I'm going to pronounce your name right. Yes, perfect. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Augustina, and and thank you to everyone uh, who's presented today. Uh, I was asked by uh, uh, the ISOC Youth Ambassador Initiative, specifically Marisha, uh, to use this opportunity to present uh, a project initiative of my own that I was working on that I feel is very relevant to this topic, uh, which was basically on visualizing the Splinter Net, which I believe is a very, very helpful addition to uh, what's going on in terms of the research space at the Internet Society, where effectively what I'm trying to do is to look at the global perspective of how countries are looking at Internet fragmentation issues and whether they're adopting any policies, legislations, or uh, you know, any, any proposals at intergovernmental levels that could contribute to increased fragmentation uh, using, for example, frameworks like uh, you know, the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping Hoping that you know throughout the course of the next year or so, this initiative will be able to take root, um, and I'm you know looking forward to collaboration with everyone because it's going to be a global project where we're going to be sourcing all these sorts of rules um, and pieces of legislation in an open source database uh, that hopefully will assist researchers. Because I was very familiar with the uh, consultation process that ISOC was going through for digital sovereignty, and I wanted to find a way to contribute to that. So I hope that this adds um, you know a lot more light and a lot more clarity to what's going on at a global level, very visually and very easily for people to see. So yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for sharing, Isan. Um, I, I was there at the session with the ambassador yesterday, and, and the presentation were very inspiring. So it's great that people here are able to, to hear what, what you are doing in relation to a split on it. Um, I guess there are some questions in the room, right, Mark? Yes. Yes, that's right, Agostina. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. The audio is still not 100% clear, but we can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks. So, yeah, there were about three or four hands that went up uh, in the room. Um, so, um, let's start over here. So, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, uh, yeah. then uh, set your uh, question. For, Keep it brief because we've got yeah, okay. a lot of people uh, wanting to take the floor. Mark, Thanks. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank you for a constructive discussion. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm a deputy director of NPO Dialogue Russia. So um, I uh, prepared one question. We uh, fully share the position uh, that the international community about the internet as a um, a global space as a home uh, for all users. Uh, however, some of the countries uh, of the world that support that principle, in fact, uh, were the first uh, to help Russia uh, find itself in IT isolation. Uh, so you said that we had plenty of services, but not in Russia now. So uh, we uh, live without services and applications that we were used to, without corporate software products uh, necessary for businesses, and with million uh, blocked bank trans trans transactions. Mm, to say more, all Russian internet users uh, remember activities of Meta um, at the February, uh, so, uh, which did nothing to block uh, calls uh, for violence against Russians and allow uh, cruel ads uh, for Russian audience. Uh, don't you think uh, that uh, this is kind of uh, two-faced and um, is it a new sort of uh, discrimination? And how would you uh, comment on the, all of the current uh, situation? Uh, thank you.
Thank you for that question. Um, who'd like to um, take uh, a first stab at uh, responding? Julia? Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't think I can probably respond to all your questions, but I want to make one point, which is, um, of course, there is the internet, there's um, this network of network uh, connected infrastructure, and there's also services on the network. And many of these services are run by private organizations, which have their own reasons to perform business in parts of the world or not. Um, but what you might also have seen is that whenever there was a request to the community, to the technical community that governs the internet, um, to shut down anything related to a specific country, this was denied because we believe that having open access to the internet is really important. But of course, we cannot control every company that is offering a service on top of the internet. Thank you, Maria. Agostina, do you want to um, see if there's a, a reply or response from, from uh, your side? I don't see any reactions here. What I'm seeing on the chat is a comment by, made by Ethan, who is saying that he's sharing a link to um, to one of our blogs where uh, we wrote a book about imposing internal restrictions and and on blockage in Russia. So I think that's a very good uh, resource. I I don't see any other comments here. Okay, uh, there's a hand just gone up to uh, with a supplementary answer, but we need to get on to an, the next question. But if you want to be quick, please. Um, Have you got a mic? To come to... Yeah, get to a mic, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Alexander Savin from University. I'm also from Russia. I want to respond to this person that everything she, she explained happened because uh, of Mr. Putin and, and his supporting NGO. I would like to remind her that uh, I saw Russian chapter has been shut down as foreign agent five years ago. And then I, uh, Internet Society was not able to tell uh, Mr. Putin and his uh, surroundings that doing all this stuff on the internet and even with neighboring country is very bad. So now you are, uh, as pro-government and NGO is eating exactly your own food. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Let's go to the next uh, question in the room. Um, I hope there are several hands that went up. Um, so you please second from the end there and then we'll go to the f f person right at the end. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, and it actually does does tie to the previous question a little bit, which is, to what extent do we allow our fear of a splinter net to give leverage to rogue agents who use the, unless you give us leverage about this regulation or that regulation, um, we're going to to result in a splinter in a splinter net. Um, you know, as the as history shows. Um, you know, often governments will, in the name of digital sovereignty, make certain demands and so on and so forth, and use this threat of a splinter net as a way to, to get their way in, in, in other things. And, you know, I, I think we need to be quite cautious when it comes to dealing with certain actors that we don't, allow, don't fall into the trap of going, we value a global interconnected internet so much that we're prepared to let it lose some of its core open human rights orientated elements. Um, I, I, I think there, there are bigger threats that, that can be lost if we don't lose that. And unfortunately, Russia is a prime example of the problem of allowing um, countries to, to behave in a certain way um, early on, and, and then, then we have, a, have both a splinter net and a human rights crisis. Okay, thanks. Does, do any of the um, speakers want to, to comment on following that intervention? Agostina? I'm seeing a comment from Andrew on the chat. And it's okay if I read out loud. And do you please jump in? Well, yeah, well, this was actually in response to the pre that, that thing in the chat was in response to the previous person. But I think there's a, a really fundamental point here that we need to we, we need to pay attention to. If if we start opening the door to the idea that we're going to turn off network con connectivity towards any particular country because of the bad behavior or what we regard as the bad behavior of the government of that country, people living within that jurisdiction, all of the people, including those who may oppose that government, are negatively affected by, by the decision about connectivity. So what happens is as we start to support anything that looks like splintering in an effort to try to do something about a government that we may regard as, as 
is behaving incorrectly, we will affect negatively the critics of that government. But governments, nation states, have the ability, after all, to go around these restrictions. The internet is extraordinarily plastic. It is really, really difficult to cut off um, all access from uh, somebody who has the resources of a nation state um, to put behind it. And in order to do that, you would have to you know, damage the internet badly enough that it would, it would be bad for the rest of us as well. So our argument, uh, at least the Internet Society's position, is not that um, you know sanctions um, will never work under any circumstances, but rather that the the you know trying to use economic sanction mechanisms to and apply them to connectivity on the internet harms the people who are uh, whom we might want not to harm, and it doesn't actually have any of the negative consequences on the people we do want to harm, and therefore you shouldn't do it. Thank you, Andrew. Matt, are there any more hands in the room? I see one online. Should we go to online then? Okay. So, um, the, is the name, the name is young. So it's Siva. 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 Okay. Please, please jump in. Okay. Uh, Noel was mentioning about uh, countries uh, having their own clocks uh, for some reason. Is there some way uh, by which uh, the Internet Society or ICANN can buy a clock or uh, set it to UTC and then ask, uh, make it a convention uh, or a good practice for uh, uh, every network uh, to synchronize the clock to the Internet clock, some sort of an Internet clock? Thank you. Anyone would like to address that? There actually is an, I mean, there isn't an internet clock. And the internet clock is a fatally bad idea. You should never have one thing. Um, but what there is, is the internet time system. Uh, this is coordinated through uh, an IANA time zone database. And um, you can use the uh, network time service to synchronize among various, um, uh, various clocks on the internet. And these are all ultimately attached to atomic clocks so that there is a, um, uh, there is a consistency to it. So the problem that Noah was talking about was a country coming along and ordering people within the borders to use the central government clock as opposed to all of the other clocks in the world. And this increases fragility in, instead of making things better it makes things worse probably a well-intended i mean I, who knows it might not be a well-intended um uh, goal, uh, idea probably it was a well-intended idea it just increases fragility and i think that was the point of this uh, of, of that example in the sovereignty discussion thank you and mark are there more questions in the room yes uh Two or three hands have gone up. Uh, there's a lady waiting, waiting very patiently at the far end there, so I'll turn to her first and then uh, then maybe take two more from the room. Thanks. Thank you. Helani Galpaya from Learn Asia. And a completely different question. Do the speakers consider um, pricing based, like sending party pay, uh, pace mechanisms or receiving party like zero rating, a form of fragmentation? Thank you. Okay, anybody want to take that from the uh, from the panel of speakers? So I can start. So I think this is a really clear um, example of one thing that could impact what the internet needs to exist, right? The internet was meant to be simple. It was meant to um, enable anyone who wants to join the internet to become part of the internet, internet in a way that is easily accessible. The minute you start to introduce conditions or additional um, uh, additional things that you need to do to be able to access the internet, the the minute we start to get more, it starts to become more complicated. And I do see this as a form of fragmentation. We're creating um, privilege access, um, which I think is opposed to the principles of the internet. And so, um, to come back on some of the earlier comments as well. Um, I don't think in some case, I don't, you know, I think this is one of the examples of many decisions could lead to that 
that worst case scenario we're splitting it right it might not be one single decision but just like each drop contributes to a flood this is a really great example of a decision that undermines what the internet needs to exist in the first place i don't know if my colleagues have any other comments on this thank you natalie being Maybe. conscious of time how many hands up do we have in the room mark uh could you show your hands again who want to speak uh, next? One, two, three, four. Okay. We've got about four, I think. Because we're not supposed to end this evening three minutes, but we were late. So, Mark, can we take a couple of minutes longer, like maybe five uh, minutes or 10 minutes more? So, we also give the room to our colleague from the Ethiopia chapter to not welcome, but maybe say goodbye to people attending the, the forum. Can we do that? Can we take 10 minutes more? Is that possible there? I think so. The next session starts here on the hour um okay. which is like 15 minutes after we're due to finish so i think we can do it um okay, and apologies to all that we uh, don't have room video. more questions from the room there is one online and then we can give uh, the floor to our calling on the tube chapter to to close the session so we have the opportunity to speak as well and there is something that we cannot see from here how many people are at the room Total number of people in the room is about 70. We've got, uh, okay. as I say, four or five hands going up now. Okay, so yeah, we can continue now with the question, but because we cannot see it from here, I was curious to, to know. You are mute now. Shall we, we go to a question in the room? Shall we go to a question in the room, I guess? Yeah, let's go to a question in the room. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, sir, if you'd like to introduce yeah. yourself first. Thank and... you. I'm, my name is Tim. I'm also from Russia, too many Russians speaking today. So I, I'd like to make two short points. First of all, that uh, one of the previous speakers actually said, practically said, the Russians should suffer because they are Russians. So I totally disagree on that. And my idea is, why don't we take as a rule that we keep political issues and political questions, which are very complex, out of the discussion? Because we are discussing infrastructure and we are discussing how to build bridges rather than how to fire them. Uh, secondly, you mentioned that the Facebook issue was related to some private company, and I can't uh, I can't argue on that because Facebook is a really private company. But my idea, my point is that Facebook is so big that it has uh, too big impact on how the internet develops and we cannot uh, not take this into consideration thank you so much thank you very much um shall we anybody want to respond to that from the speakers or shall we go to the next uh, question i think being conscious of time we can go to the next question Okay, thanks. I forget who put their hand up first, but uh, maybe on this side. Yes. Okay, sir, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, put your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lee McKnight, uh, Syracuse University. I have a question for Miria. Uh, speaking on the internet uh, fragility issue, like, could you give some specific examples of like what, what are you worrying about in, uh, at the IAB level as opposed to at the application and service level? Thank you. Let me give you a very specific um, example. There uh, was the case only a few weeks ago where some IP, blocks, IP addresses were blocked, um, which belonged to Cloudflare, which is a CDN provider serving many, many websites. Um, if these IP addresses, the original intent of blocking these IP addresses were like for good or bad reasons, I don't even want to judge that. But um, somehow this was implemented in a wrong technical way without people having the knowledge about the impact they um, increase on that and having a large impact on Internet users in Austria, which really wasn't um, intended. And this is just like one of the examples where maybe the policy in, uh, intent might be good or bad. As I said, I don't comment on this, but it's definitely one of the wrong ways to implement it and bridging this gap of understanding is, I think, important role for this forum here. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Agustina, shall we go to an online question first, uh, next, and then maybe back into the room? 
Sure. I see one hand from the uh, church lab, if I'm not mispronouncing your name. Uh, yes, you are right. Which is what you're working. Uh, I'm uh, working as a policy advisor and uh, working. Uh, many colleagues uh, know me as a representative of Russia in WAP, in ICANN. I'm working in ITU, uh, G20, internet issues, and so on and so forth. I want, I have a one. I to say practical question. Uh, today, uh, Natalie uh, speak about uh, about uh, needs for governments to anticipate consequences, impact of their regulation for the future of internet, as well uh, as Andrew say about digital uh, sovereignty and rights of governments to regulate uh, uh, issues related to internet. Yes, it's right. Uh, but practical question, uh, how we can um, um, organize cooperation of governments or harmonization of uh, the uh, regulation? Because uh, now we have uh, some sort of dualism, and, uh, all talking about uh, uh, preventing fragmentation, about one world, one internet, and after that, in uh, national sovereignty, uh, continue to regulate uh, uncoordinated efforts for regulation internet. And most important that this regulation include ex territorial uh, norms. This is dangerous. Uh, practical question how we can, how, uh, what do you think, how we can organize uh, cooperation of governmental uh, bodies? Uh, for internet regulation, because we have, uh, as a representative of government, we have a number of initiatives in the United Nations, in First Committee, in ITU, and so on and so forth. In, in G20, by the way, uh, no big success, no common ground. Where you see common ground for uh, governmental cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for, for your comment. Any reactions? Uh, I a quick reaction. So the reason that we created the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit is not to solve necessarily the challenges of a lot of different approaches to regulation. How do we harmonize those approaches that might have very different goals to work together in a way that is uniform? What the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit does is it helps us analyze government proposals or business decisions and make sure that it achieves the objective of understanding how it impacts what the internet needs to exist in the first place. And so it's not to say it's the be all end all. If we have a particular, particular legislative goal, there might be other types of impact assessments that we want to be aware of or other ways that we can collaborate to actually achieve this goal. But what the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit does is it helps us prevent harming the internet on the path to achieving whatever the policy goal is. And so this is why, as I mentioned before, the more that we start embedding that as part of due diligence, maybe not the only due diligence to achieving policy objectives that we have, but we need to make sure that we're protecting what the internet needs to exist in the first place. And if the internet way is a way that we want to continue supporting um, to begin with. Thank you, Natalie. Um, before we go to the final question uh, in the room, there are a lot of comments on the chat that I think people uh, on site cannot see it. For example, there is a, a comment from Pedro highlighting the importance of the ICF as a tool for that kind of cooperation. And uh, so I get that this conversation, this conversation is also showing uh, the need of uh, multi stakeholder cooperation and the need for continue discussing these issues. So, Mark, we'd like to take the last question before we go to Adona. Okay, thanks, uh, Agassina. So, we've got chance for one last question. Sure. So, it, I'll, keep it short. Short. Yeah, I'll keep it short. Um, there was a morning session uh, similar to this one. I'm confused. I'm sort of new to this, but 
Fragmentation seems to have uh, multiple meanings, and depending on which room and which conversation I've sat in, I hear it used differently. So I'm, the, the user fragmentation versus the core of the internet fragmentation seems to me where I sort of get lost in this conversation. And I was hoping, is there an explanation of what we mean by fragmentation when we use the word fragmentation? Because it seems to me that if the Russians wanted to email the Ukrainians, that's still possible because the internet, the core of the internet is still there. So that's not fragmented, but it's the upper layers, user experience and so on and so forth. And just a quick second question is, we've used examples of member states um, creating fragility or fragmentation. I'm just curious, are there private sector examples? Okay, anybody from the uh, panel of speakers wants to comment? Miria? Yes, so, um, I mean, what we want to, what, what the goal behind the internet is connecting people and giving people access to information. But this also means that the internet has to run as one network. Um, and imposing restrictions, blocking and fragmentations on all layers really risks that the internet breaks apart. Currently, yes, you can still send an email. Um, but if you if you implement things on the lower layer, this can also impact connectivity. So yes, the things we're talking about are different on the technical level, um, different approaches, different solutions, but I think the risk behind this is the same, that we lose the value of one connected people and we're not having a, f a forum anywhere where people can freely access information. That is, that is a big goal behind this. Does that help you? But we can chat more offline. <laughs> Okay, um, I guess it back to you. Yeah, I think uh, we are approaching the end of the session. I, I'm sorry to to cut the discussion now, and I'm sorry for for starting this this session late. It was great uh, to know that we have many people in the room, many people online, and a lot of interest in in the topic. I hope the conversation around these issues can continue online and in the hallway for those that are in Addis. And um, for us, internet fragmentation will continue to be a key topic for uh, in 2023. So stay tuned for how to, to get involved. As Natalie uh, highlighted, we have uh, the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit for all of you to use. And as Noel shared, we are about to release uh, our white paper on digital sovereignty on Thursday, right, Noel? And um, so, yes, um, please stay tuned for, for that. But before we close this session, uh, I would like to give a couple of minutes to our Ethiopian chapter leader, Adobna, uh, to say a few words and um, to welcome you, you all to his country. So, Adobna, I'm sorry that you were not able to speak at the beginning, but I hope we can hear you now. Yes, uh, I'm hearing you. Hello, everyone. Are you hearing me, Augustina? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Andrew. Uh, I'm honored to be here to speak about my country and uh, chapter. First, let me welcome you all to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the capital city of Africa. Uh, we to Africa, Madina, Addis Ababa, and Matach, in Amharic. Please allow me to say a few words about my country, Ethiopia, and I Ethiopia chapter. Uh, to start from Ethiopia, Ethiopia is Africa's oldest independent country, second largest in population in Africa and land of origins. Ethiopia, as an inception of Pan-Africanism, served as a symbol of African independence. We have a unique and diverse heritage, our own alphabet, calendar, and being a founding member of AU, uh, UN, and other international uh, organizations. Now, I think Ethiopia has 11 regional states and two chartered cities. Uh, after having this about Ethiopia, let me give you some highlight about uh, Ethiopia chapter. Ethiopia chapter is a national non-profit, multi-professional association registered under the, the law of Ethiopia and chartered by internet society, sharing the vision and open, globally connected, secure, reliable, and affordable internet for everyone. And it was established during 2020 with Ethiopian scholars from different uh, disciplines living and working in different parts of the country. Uh, we are happy to see the global IGF happening in Addis and uh, we're launching the national IGF this year and we are working on the report. We support as uh, 
chapter and were part of advisory committee. Uh, finally, uh, I want to challenge the on-site participants, not the online. Uh, please try to taste our uh, Ethiopian coffee and visit our historic uh, places and make time to visit everything in Addis. We sh I think we have a good uh, conversation and presentation this session. Thank you very much. Ethiopia. Yeah, you're back. Thank you, Abena, and thank you very much to everyone attending the session, both on site and online. Thank you, Mark, uh, for your support in Addis, and thank you to my colleagues and to the panelists. So it was a great session, and it was great to hearing from from all of you. Thank you, Agnes. There's no people in the room. Can you leave quickly because the next session is wants to start now? And apologise uh, profusely to them for uh, running right up to the time. So, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so